Allison. Hi there, Michael. And welcome to Dean's Discuss, COVID-19, a weekly po podcast in which we dive into the research done at the uh, UC Davis School of Medicine and the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Today, we're talking about the search for a vaccine and UC Davis's announcement that we'll be enrolling 120 participants in a national clinical trial. This is exciting news, uh, Allison. I can't wait to, to dive in and, and learn a little bit more about this new exciting uh, vaccine trial and, and some of the approaches that you're doing here uh, at UC Davis. So we were very excited to announce that we are part of the Pfizer uh, vaccine trial. We are looking to enroll 120 patients over a three week time frame. Um, we are very excited to be working on this trial. It's one of the new mRNA vaccines. Um, part of what we also want to do is make sure that we enroll a diverse group of patients in this particular trial to make sure that we're representing the community of Sacramento and Northern California in this really pivotal research trial. Yeah, there are several things you mentioned there which are critically important. Uh, one of those, you mentioned the word mRNA, messenger RNA, and that's a, a type of platform, and, and, and many people may be aware, but we might explore that a little bit. The, the messenger RNA um, is really a, a component of how viruses replicate. Of course, they depend upon us, um, a cell um, within an uh, animal, and we're, we're an animal, that the vaccine would, uh, a virus would normally replicate in, and as part of that normal process, they produce messages. And these messages encode or really, you know, tell the cell, produce this type of protein. And the messenger RNA platform vaccines are, are novel and, and very exciting because you can uh, construct those, you can change those easily in terms of the platform development. And in this case, uh, really focus on what may be what we call immunogenic. So parts of the virus that are going to trigger a productive immune response. So uh, the vaccine that, that will be developed in your vaccine trial is an mRNA type of vaccine. Uh, you mentioned also the, the populations. Uh, why, why is it important to, to have a full spectrum of people involved in this trial? Well, every research trial, we try to really um, uh, enroll a diverse, num diverse type of patient population, but this is even more important. As we know, COVID has disproportionately affected African-American population and Latinx population. And we want to make sure that when we're doing a trial that we're um, having the diverse population that represents our community, but also represents people who have been adversely affected uh, by the virus. You know, these trials are going to be critical to moving things forward. And I, I just know that everybody in the community is anxious. In fact, uh, we're having their phones are ringing off the hook. And so uh, okay. people are able to sign up online. At the end of the podcast, we'll uh, get our team to put that link up there so they could, everybody can see that. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, I, I think you're bringing up a very important point and something that maybe Northern California is uniquely position for, which is to assess a vaccine like this in the demographics that the full range uh, of people that are uh, on the front lines, uh, as you mentioned, the African American population, but also the Latino population. And, and this is a very important and vulnerable work uh, group, for example, in the Central Valley, where we have higher rates of COVID-19 infection. So I think it's, it's great that in Northern California, we have, we're part of this a vaccine network and, and trying to assess it within those populations. I, I imagine another factor is um, of representing multiple ages. I noticed on the, the release about the vaccine that you're really looking for patients between 18 and well into their 80s even. So uh, the age group, can you talk a little bit about that as well? Right, the first kind of uh, what we call cohort or grouping is gonna be 18 to 55, and then there's an older than 55 group. Um, the first couple of people at the site who receive the vaccine will be observed uh, for about five hours. Um, I wanna really stress something that's important for everyone to know. Any research is very closely supervised. So you, it's supervised by the FDA. It's supervised by what we call a central IRB, which is a national organization. 
and it's supervised by our local IRB, which is uh, our colleagues here at Davis, and highly regulated. So I think that should be of great comfort uh, to everyone who is considering participating in a trial. Um, these trials are have lots of visits, um, lots mm. of data collected, and lots of supervision in terms of looking for side effects. You know, uh, typically with a vaccine, the side effects are minimal soreness at the injection site or fever. And uh, this trial, like all other research trials, are designed to really look for any side effects and, of course, looking for the benefit of whether it gives an immune response. That's a really important point that you bring up. The the different phases of these trials. And uh, this one is at a phase two slash three, I noticed, in which you're really still examining data for uh, safety and efficacy, uh, both. Uh, and I, I really think that, that uh, as you mentioned, the, the stress on that of you know, knowing that any vaccine, and we do the same in animal vaccine trials, uh, it's regulated through a different government organization and we have different panels and they're looking but they're looking for the similar outcomes, which is uh, really ensuring that the vaccines and the components of the vaccines uh, are safe before they go into that. And I think people that are, that are thinking about uh, vac getting vaccinated or entering into this trial know that there's been a lot of work ahead of even getting to this point. And it, at UC Davis, we have a lot of researchers that are at all phases of that pipeline. Um, and, you know, we. We uh, actually isolated the virus and worked with the virus from the very first community spread here in Northern California using immunology labs here and to really grow up the virus in the early diagnostics. So from the early phases of understanding the virus to the components of the vaccine, all along the way, there are teams of scientists to assess. Uh, and then when it gets to this final phase where we're using volunteers, uh, closely monitoring things uh, in order to make sure that they're efficacious. And uh, we also heard this uh, last week of a vaccine in, in Russia that was uh, the world is a bit skeptical of. Um, and one of the reasons they're skeptical is they don't have that kind of data that they're publicly announcing. Uh, and that's really important that the data be uh, produced um, so that it's examined by teams of scientists that are independent of any vaccine trial. And I know that'll be done in this trial as well. You make an important point. I just want to remind um, and actually just do a shout out to the tremendous teams. Our community acquired case was the first one in the country. That was on February 26th. Uh, now we're well into the fall, August, September timeframe where we're thinking about the flu. We've been in this pandemic for almost six months. It was on March 2nd that the clinicians and the researchers and the virologists that you mentioned from our main campus and your school and our school all got together. And that's how we stood up the first test. We really began to understand the virus. Uh, we are at uh, full speed on working ahead. And I know uh, to get this trial up and running uh, with Pfizer, there's a sponsor. Uh, everyone was working overtime. Uh, UC Davis uh, School of Medicine is committed to being at the front line of research for COVID. As you know, in Sacramento, we've had an uptick in cases and it's even more important. Uh, we'll be starting another one of the remdesivir trials here shortly for the inpatients. And that's one of the only drugs that's been shown to shorten the time on a ventilator. Um, so it's it critically important to continue all these phases of research, uh, not just the vaccine, but this vaccine trial, it is all hands on deck because we've got to enroll 120 patients. Um, and that means they get, they get a shot, they get observed. Um, it been the whole trial, they end up getting two injections. So it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, I think that's uh, one of the uh, things that we've really tried to stress right from the beginning. Um, and, and you point out a very important thing, the, the rapid uh, nature of what we've learned about uh, COVID-19. Uh, literally, the, the first sequences of these viruses were uh, published in January of 2020. And uh, those sequences were really important. And now we have over 50,000 in the database of whole genome sequences of the viruses around the world to compare 
that's really unprecedented for any other viral infection in, in history. And of course, um, you know, when we think about that, uh, how do we use that information? It's to get it in the uh, re peer reviewed in the public database, and then to get teams of researchers, as you mentioned, and clinicians. Um, and academic medical centers are uniquely positioned for that early phase development. And then a later partner. Uh, one of the partners that you're working with, Pfizer, is really one of the best in terms of their credibility and their capacity. One of the things that is really important is once you get to the phase where you can prove the safety of a vaccine, you really need the production value of high quality uh, production that only large companies like Pfizer and others can, can produce because we really need, if these vaccines are efficacious, millions of doses. And we do this with other viruses, uh, influenza, for example. And we've learned through influenza that virus changes and we knew we have to adapt. And eventually, as we talked about last episode, the new reality is we will be likely living with COVID-19. Uh, it's not gonna just disappear, although um, you know, some would like it to, to say that. And these vaccines represent a really important um, uh, component of how we battle uh, viruses like this so that we can get to the point where, uh, similar to influenza, where we can vaccinate and we can adjust. And one of the values of an mRNA vaccine, as we talked about, is you can change it. So let's say the spike protein or the, the part that we're really interested in, we think is, is a component that's gonna be uh, a, a very important part of the virus. If you have a change in that and uh, we have a new virus strain come along, those mRNA vaccines can be easily changed. It's like changing an address, uh, a code uh, that the manufacturers like Pfizer and others can change and adapt. Uh, that's one of the advantages of that particular vaccine that you're developing in as part of your clinical trial. So one thing you mentioned in there, and I really want to stress this, is the word flu. So uh, flu vaccines are going to be so very important this year because if you're vaccinated for the flu, uh, you're much, much, much less likely to get it. And it's going to be really hard for the people in the urgent visit centers, the emergency rooms to differentiate flu from COVID. And that will be critical for, towards keeping um, the COVID infections under control. Uh, because testing is l somewhat limited. And so having people vaccinated for the flu. And of course, uh, parents have been missing vaccines for their children because they're not in clinics. They're not coming to the doctors much. Um, there's you know, schools, uh, which are usually ones that require aren't in session. Uh, we need parents to make sure that they're keeping up on their children's vaccinations. These are critical public health issues that we as physicians are really at the forefront. Um, one, developing the new vaccine, stressing the flu vaccine, and making sure that children keep on their vaccination schedules. Because without that, we, uh, you know, we, things could get far worse, particularly you know, flu is a very serious disease, as is COVID. That's a really important point that you're bringing up. And, and we've seen that uh, when we don't vaccinate as a populations, we see upticks in, in viral infections, measles, a very highly contagious uh, disease of, of children and, and adults both has been um, increasing and because people are not vaccinating. And uh, scourges such as polio are, are no longer scourges because uh, back in the, the, the 40s and 50s and 60s, as those vaccines were developed, uh, people were vaccinating their children. So, you know, people like Franklin Delano Roosevelt was really motivated. He was a polio victim. And, uh, but the, the, the scenes of people vaccinating back then, the rallying around uh, getting uh, kids vaccinated for polio really allowed that to be under control. It's interesting that, uh, you know, when we talk about vaccines, we're not talking about eradication. There are, um, there are a couple of instances in the world of eradicated viral infection, smallpox being one of those success stories. And an animal's render pest, which is a devastating disease of cattle, has been eradicated and has no longer been seen. And that was part because of an effective vaccine. But really, mostly vaccines are controlling. And as you mentioned, um, in, in part of that control is the 
cooperation of the public. And the cooperation of the public means that once we have produced all of that data in that many hours and years and, and uh, data that says this is an efficacious vaccine, we need to have people use it. Um, and then even if it's not 100% efficacious, meaning that every single person gets 100% immunity, it goes a long way towards controlling it in a population and really eases the tension within our society and allows us to go back to what we're uh, normally, our, our normal daily life. You know, Michael, um, you, you are an expert in these areas. Um, can you describe the difference between what people worry about live vaccines versus the mRNA? Um, I think, uh, you know, I still to this day, people say, oh, I'm not going to get the flu vaccine because it'll give me the flu, which is not true. Um, can you speak to that uh, in your, because you're very knowledgeable about mm -hmm. the viruses um, in your work? Yeah, there, when we talk about vaccines, uh, both in animals and in people, some of the original vaccines, when we go back to the late 1800s, the word vaca, vaca, uh, came from uh, cows. That's a, a word for cow, and it was from observing animal infections, cowpox, uh, in milking. Um, people that milked cows were resistant to smallpox, a related virus. That would be an example of a, um, a live vaccine, so you're actually injecting people or exposing people to a live vaccine. And uh, there are uh, modified live vaccines that are weaker vaccines that were initially tried. Those uh, are, have uh, a lot of advantages because they look like the normal viral infection. And so the body reacts to them with the full range of immune responses. But in today's world, because of those safety issues that, that you recommended, most vaccines are not live vaccines per se. They're uh, either what we call killed vaccines or they're parts of the virus and they represent a very important uh, stage of, of what is in the vaccine. But with modern technology, um, which is what we're talking about today, we're able to actually focus and focus on what parts and pieces of the vaccine are really needed to produce antibodies and also what we call cell-mediated immunity. So these are memory T cells and B cells. These are cells that, that are there in your body. They react and they, they have enough of an immunological memory that the next time you're exposed, they can get ramp, ramped up quickly to produce antibodies or cells that uh, stop the viral infection. So what has really changed is the technology. So in your case, with your vaccine trial, that messenger, that uh, RNA, uh, which is from the, uh, really from the code of the vaccine, is really about the spike protein, which is the outer coating. And so the message goes in, it actually produces our own cells, uh, produce uh, what would be the, the imagen within the body. The advantage of that is our cells may treat it differently than anybody else's cells. So your cells are uniquely making that message into something that would be immunogenic and allow that vaccine to be efficacious. So modern technology is really at the heart of this vaccine trial that, that uh, the, the School of Medicine and the health systems at UC Davis are um, piloting here. So I also want to make a really important point. Um, uh, some of you may know I'm a neurologist. And I want to make absolutely clear that vaccines do not cause autism because I don't want anybody out there to think and worry about those type of things. Vaccines are one of the most important public health things that we can do as a community. And flu is a great example of that. So um, these are incredibly important pieces that we have in our public health armamentarium, and we're really trying to expand that. So, you know, we should not have concerns about vaccines. Um, now, of course, the vaccines are going to be very well monitored, as I mentioned before, but in general, these vaccines that children get and the flu vaccines, um, they're so important, and they, the, the, the benefits are tremendous to the public health community. And in fact, you know, the truth is um, we are still going to be doing everything we're doing now, social distancing and masks for quite a bit of time, because even if these vaccines work, 
um, it's going to be a while until everyone is vaccinated and we get what we call herd immunity. I think that's from some of your cows, maybe. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think we just need to keep our eye on the future. Um, you know, we've had an uptick in cases here in Sacramento and uh, have to believe some of that's from people not wearing masks and not not social distancing and not doing the things that we've been talking about. We know California can do it. We did it before, um, but we're going to have to continue to do those things for a good long time. Yeah, and you bring up an uh, important point. Uh, you know, we we never stop uh, at a university like ours, and one of the things that uh, we need to understand also is we're constantly. Uh, looking at what the virus is doing within the populations and studying the virus. When uh, COVID first um, happened, we thought it was a respiratory disease, but of course we know now that there are other uh, disease complications. And we're gonna talk about that in our next podcast. And I hope people uh, turn in to listen. Well, Allison, this has been a great discussion and I would encourage everybody to join us next week where we're gonna talk a little bit about what we continually to investigate, which is that COVID-19, which we thought was only a respiratory infection, really has a lot of other effects uh, on uh, us. And uh, those are continuing to be very insightful and uh, look forward to talking about that. Great, I'm Allison Brashear, the Dean of the UC Davis School of Medicine, and you've been listening to Dean's Discuss COVID-19 podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you won't miss an episode. And we welcome your questions and ideas on topics for future episodes. You can email us at deansdiscussed at ucdavis.edu. In the meantime, you can also visit ucdavis.edu backslash COVID-19 for the latest coronavirus research here at Davis. And we will see you next week.